What's up, everybody? I'm Reggie Williams, founder and CEO of Ambrosia for Heads. And with me, I have Jake Payne, our editor in chief. And together, this is our What's the Headline podcast. Believe it or not, just a few seconds ago, Jake and I were laughing and smiling as we typically do. Uh, <laughs> so I think we're going to bring some of that into uh, more of that into the intro, man. Just like, you know, let it flow. We always got jokes on one another. We might as well let everyone else in on what we do to each other behind the scenes, Paul. So, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> How you doing, man? Yeah, I'm doing okay. It's, uh, yeah, man, it's, it's been a few weeks since we've, we've gotten to talk about, you know, the hip hop news and music, man. So I'm, I've actually been really looking forward to this. How about you? What a crazy lineup, man. We got Sky Zoo and then Evidence. It's, it's been a great, great couple of weeks, man. I really enjoyed both those conversations. Yeah. And I mean, you know, Ev is, I've been telling people uh, my album of the year so far and, and Sky is, is right there too. I mean, if I have to pick, you know, three albums of the year right now, like my, my rotation, it's J. Cole, it's Ev. And that third one, Sky is easily a contender for, and that could, you know, he could very easily jump into pole position in time. So I'm really proud of those conversations. Um, been thinking a lot about gentrification and I just really valued on top of the music side. Just we had some real ass conversation and discussion with Sky just on the subject of, of colonization and gentrification and some of these issues that are, are lingering in our cities. Yeah, man, all those made our top 10 of 2021 list so far. So I encourage everyone to check that out. Um, I think it's it still holds up in my opinion. Yeah. I'm already starting to revisit my Makami assessment. I think okay. he's 100% uh, going to be on the top for 2021 for me. Um, but on the gentrification point, I was in bed this weekend, yesterday, um, and it was amazing, man. There is no other place in the country that I've seen that is more diverse. And so obviously, you know, the gentrification thing is not something that we want to see, but I do celebrate the diversity, at least in Bed-Stuy and Brooklyn in general. You know, I think when people talked about melting pots and myths like that, um, I think it represents the ethos of America better than any place I've seen so far. So that was pretty dope. Yeah, I mean, I was thinking of it yesterday, too. I mean, you know, this past weekend was the 4th of July. Some folks celebrate uh, Independence Day. Some folks don't for a litany of reasons, be it you're not in America, you don't agree with it, et cetera. Um, you know, I'm, I'm set up in West Philly and I have never been a big fan of fireworks, uh, viewing them or doing them, but, uh, you know, I have been entrenched in my community and a participant and a citizen of my community for a number of years. And, um, I'm also a, a dog owns me, I'll say, and, and my dog Theo frequently makes appearances on this podcast unexpected. And as you probably know, fireworks are hell for dogs. Um, just And, you know, one of the conversations in gentrification that I see a lot of folks moving into urban neighborhoods and having a problem with traditions. And, you know, my neighborhood was, was crazy yesterday with just sights and sounds and booms and explosions. And, um, you know, I, I saw a really interesting tweet out there of people moving into neighborhoods and looking to change traditions that have been going on for decades. And immediately my mind went to my conversation with Sky Zoo and what's the difference between somebody who moves into a neighborhood to participate in it and somebody that moves into a neighborhood with plans to change it. So, you know, um, yeah, just definitely something that's been going on in, in, in my uh, headspace. Yeah, and that, that's exactly what I mean, man. Um, I'm glad you raised that because what I'm talking about is block party after block party, right? and people there just celebrating together. No, no one trying to change anything, people actually trying to uplift and, and participate. And in fact, one of the dopest ones was led by uh, Chi Ose. Does that name ring a bell to you? Uh, is that Reggie's wife? Uh, it's Reggie's son. Son, son. 22 years old, just got elected uh, city councilman for Bed-Stuy, um, you know, um, a very staunch advocate for Black Lives Matter, uh, openly gay, um, LGBTQ plus advocate, and a DJ, you know, mm -hmm. and so he's spinning um, outside of a record store. And again, and this is the this is the craziness about gentrification, because it's a record store that had been there 15 years or so, and is getting pushed out. The landlord apparently, uh, they had a handshake deal and told the, the record store owners just like a week ago, they had to be out by the end of the week. 
And so they raised uh, money on GoFundMe, supposedly raised $15,000 to throw a party, bought food for the neighborhood, had the DJ, and really, you know, went out like on a high. Um, and of course, it's going to be replaced by a, a wine, uh, wine bar. So uh, that was like, yeah, man, I witnessed like the whole like complexity of Sky Zoo's album, like uh, just like, and to your point, you know, th there were there were fireworks everywhere, you know, um, people were out peaceful, having a good time, walked by one party and there were not one, but two, not two, but three police cars, just like at the end of the block, just lights flashing. They were sitting there just like monitoring, but it was like, yo, do you really need three? Like, I mean, there's really something gonna pop off with a police officer right there. But yeah, it's interesting, man. It's really interesting to see it like uh, up close and personal, you know? Hmm. Word and, and rest in peace to combat Jack. Somebody I know you knew better than I did, but that we both knew, you know? Yeah, yeah, Reggie was a good dude. I actually went up to Chi and let him know that I knew his dad, man. And you could see Reggie and Chi, uh, it was pretty dope. And that's the kind of thing, man, I was thinking yesterday, man, like, just imagine, like, if he could see his son now, this dude mm. was flourishing, a city councilman at 22, like, it's, it's just such an amazing thing. And that, that's when it really hits you, like, um, you know, those kind of losses when you think about like what people weren't able to see, but the story continues, you know, after all of us. So. So I'm, 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 I think I'm 19 year professional journalist and, and one of my ultimate pet peeves in hip hop media and reporting is the false death. Um, and this week, uh, several publications, uh, prominent publications, reported that Bismarcky had passed at the age of 57. And, you know, for the last year, um, Bismarcky's health has been uh, in, in question. Um, his family in July of 2020, you know, right when COVID was, was I think, very much around its peak, um, revealed that Biz had been in, a, in and out of the hospital since April of last year. Um, He'd been battling type two diabetes, which, you know, uh, I hope I'm explaining this properly, but type two diabetes is, is the form that, that you are not born with, but that you get. Um, and there's a number of factors that can cause it. And, you know, Biz had been open about that throughout the last decade. Um, he had revealed that his weight uh, at one point had gotten close to 400 pounds. I think it was around 380. Um, and he was able around 2013 to turn some of that around through exercise. Um, you know, Biz at that point, you know, was over the age of 40, definitely in his middle age. Um, and somebody who I, I feel like, you know, has had kind of a public battle with his health. Um, you know, for anyone that's been following, and it's not necessarily our business, but, you know, Biz, when he came into the game in the late 80s, was not you know, he had a very different physique than he had later in his career. Um, and he was open about that. But to see, um, and it's weirdly for me, I went to bed um, only to wake up and look at my social media and see not only some people posting RIP, which really threw me off to wake up to in the morning, but then see a lot of um, prominent hip hop figures condemning the media, which I do feel as though you and I are part of, it was a really just kind of frustrating experience. Yeah, you know, and it's something that you and I have dealt with in the past. Um, the one that comes to mind for me is Lil Wayne. Mm -hmm. And you remember like four or five years ago, there were reports of Lil Wayne having a seizure. I think it was on a plane and that, you know, he was in critical condition and people didn't think he was gonna make it. Um, that ended up not, you know, he, he did have seizures, but he was, he was fine ultimately. Uh, you and I have had to deal with that with Nipsey. I remember vividly, you know, I was watching the NCAA game with Duke and you hit me up and saying Nipsey had been shot and it didn't look good, but, you know, we didn't want to you know, be, you know, too aggressive in like speculating. But then, uh, you know, a few minutes later, unfortunately, he succumbed to those injuries. This is something that we as journalists have to deal with quite a bit. And there's a balance between being, um, being first and being right. And that's something that Big Daddy Kane spoke about on Instagram very, very powerfully, I thought, um, you know, straight to the point. Um, we've always, I believe, erred on the side of being right. 
and being cautious and being conservative about things. And I think I, I give you a lot of credit on that. And it's not just for this kind of stuff. It's for anything that might come from a source that's a little bit suspect. There's a lot of like shenanigans going on about that Wu-Tang album again, you know, that went to Martin Shkreli about it being, you know, changing hands and all sorts of stuff like that. And you have been one to not really fall for the okie doke. Uh, so I celebrate you and really, I think, helping keep um, us uh, more pristine about that. But we also do ha have had to take precautions at times. Like, um, I think that, you know, what a lot of people might not realize, and this isn't just for internet publications, this has been tried and true for television, you know, watching TV for a long time, for newspapers that, uh, most entities that are news outlets have prepackaged kind of obituaries for you know hundreds and hundreds of people so that if and when it happens and unfortunately it is in inevitable that people will die either of natural causes or unnatural ones at some point that they can be you know quick to uh, publish that or you know or put that out there but what's your thought on that you, you think it's macabre you think it's just practical or what do you think yeah, I mean, I, I do think it's practical um, at a time and I don't like writing them. Um, and I, this is an area that I struggle with the rap media a lot. Um, one thing I can say is that neither you nor I um, await death and, and that shouldn't even have to be said. But I think there are a lot of people that see the upside of, of being first and the windfall of traffic that comes with that. Um, and they don't they don't care. I mean, you know, it's 2005 and the Internet and the social media around it was a very different place. But Eric B of Eric B and Rakim was reported dead. And that, and, and a lot of publications, um, in, including, I believe, the one I worked for at the time, had to come back and retract that. And, you know, there was this this time when people like the hoax was a big thing. And, you know, forums would report somebody dead and people were not checking their sources. And for me. One of the reasons I rush when I hear somebody has passed, and I, I believe this is true of you too, Reggie, is we have an opportunity to be the newspaper of record. And one of the things that frustrates me, and I thought of this a lot with Biz, is Biz Markie was so much more than just a friend. I think for a lot of hip hop heads, that moment isn't even the moment. And, you know, when, you know, I look at this year, when, when Black Rob or Chimoto or Prince Marky D or Gift of Gab, who we were going to talk about in a second pass, I often find that those people that are first have the story that everyone kind of copies and aggregates. And for me, one of the things that's really upset me as a fan and as a, as a member of this culture is when those are just snapshots or they're erroneous, when people say they grew up in one place and they didn't, or they were part of this movement and maybe they weren't. Um, and it's just really, really upsetting because there are folks, and you and I are two of them, that live this culture every single day. And when I saw Big Daddy Kane and Pete Rock and, um, you know, other folks really upset about this, I hope that it's a wake up call because, in, and, and there, there's a bigger argument there that could be made of like, you know, what are we really doing to train our journalists? How are we compensating them? What is the system of checks and balances to get a published, you know, a story published? All of that has merit, but what's more than that is is just doing the right thing and waiting. Um, and yeah, I mean that's huge. And, and also too, there should be a level of integrity. You mentioned the Nipsey Hussle, um, you know, incident and 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 his his passing. And there were people out there that were eager to include. I mean, truly respected publications were eager to include footage of his body on the pavement. And you and I have put so much care into this culture, even down to the images that we use and the semantics that go into a headline of every possible way that something can, can be construed. And it's just really upsetting. Yeah, man, I mean, it's part of the reason why you and I stopped doing the day-to-day -day grind of the site because ultimately it just turned into chasing clicks and that leads to really really perverse outcomes you know it's not a place that we wanted to be we've never been about thirst we've always been about quality and um i think it's helped us to maintain our integrity um by 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 being more of kind of like a weekly publication um and you know 
yeah, we see it, man. We see we see uh, publications that we've respected over the years really starting to you know have very questionable journalism. I, I hate to even use that word, and I think it's a lot of it's pressure just bottom line. But yeah, it's unfortunate, you know. And just picking up on your point, man, about Biz. Biz Marquis is an incredibly important artist to me, you know. Um, Kane uh, I was one of my favorite rappers. He was probably my third favorite rapper. You know, like my first favorite rapper was Melly Mel, and then it was LL, and then it was Kane, and then it was Cube, and like it goes on and on. But Biz was always right up there, man. Going off in 87, when that dropped, that was a game changer for me. You know, nobody beats the Biz and picking, picking boogers and vapors and... He's just got so many joints. I sent you a song of the day or um, a couple of days ago, Young Girl Blues. People don't even probably remember that joint, like off his other second or third album. But he is, uh, to me, and just a friend, I, I, I it was probably one of my least favorite Biz tracks you know, yeah. because it was kind of the, the pop joint. And I don't knock it because it got him paid and um, really made him big. And it was classic Biz, you know, always like, uh, goofing off and making people feel good. You know, one of the things we had um, with AFH TV was a clip from Ralph McDaniels with Biz doing a, a freestyle from the toilet. You know, that's just, that's how he has been. And so I don't want, you know, all this to lose sight of just the great artists that uh, is suffering right now, you know, yeah. and, and whose health is in really, a really bad place. You know, we talk a lot about celebrating people while they're here, giving them the flowers while they're here. So, you know, I'm grateful to be able to give Biz some flowers now, you know. Yeah. And just to echo that, I mean, I, um, I've done a lot of thinking and appreciation of Biz, even though I'm, I'm so happy to say that he is still with us. Um, you know, Biz, as far as I can tell, is the only member of the Juice crew to go platinum, you know, and I know it's just a friend. But still, that's an important thing. When I look and I, I say that Cool G Rap deserves so much so many more flowers than the charts or the RIAA can ever give. And it's true of Kane and it's true of Master Ace and certainly true of Marley Mall, who I consider to be in the Mount Rushmore of, of, of hip hop production all day long. Um, and yeah, you know, and, and, and Biz, you and I talked about this with Day Law. It's, it's an interesting thing. Um, you know, people associate Biz too with a landmark sample case with Gilbert O'Sullivan in Alone Again, which was kind of a throwaway joint on Biz's third album, I Need a Haircut. But, you know, Biz made um, really important music that wasn't always a single either. You know, like, I almost texted it to you this week, but he has a joint called My Man Rich, which is very whimsical. And he's just dedicating a song to his friend over a Crusader sample. And um, I appreciated Biz. I loved his accessibility. And I'm, you know, I'm 37. So one of the things for me is I remember seeing Biz Marquee on In Living Color um, in like 93 and 94 as a featured guest. He wasn't on every episode, but he would appear alongside Jamie Foxx on the dozens and, and different things like that. And I knew of his rap career because I would see his, his music, um, you know, at the music pawn, stop, pawn shops, because by that point, you know, rap's guard had changed. And I just think that He's phenomenally talented and he's a great example of a beatboxer, an MC, a DJ, and a great producer. Um, you know, somebody I talked to today is Kid Capri. And people forget Biz produced a lot of Kid Capri's first album, produced a lot for Granddaddy IU, produced a lot of, you know, he supplied a lot of the samples that Marley used for Kane. Um, Biz is an undersung hero of hip hop. And one of my favorite hip hop moments was being, you know, 15 years old and watching him DJ live for the first time to kick off the Spit Kicker tour in 2000, which you and I just talked about in our year 2000 episode. And um, yeah, I just we need more of that. We need more of celebrating our heroes and and not certainly not preemptively uh, reporting their passings. Yeah, man. And, and you mentioned the DJ piece like that is something that sustains him. Years later, after you know uh, things have cooled on the recording side, he was every bit as much of a celebrity DJ or DJ for celebrities, um, you know, in the late 2000s as like a D nice. You know, yeah. I remember going to several functions, BT and otherwise, and Biz would be you know just killing it. So, um, you know, 
the reports don't sound good. You know, they sound like he is really struggling and um, that, you know, you know, that people are, are concerned, but, you know, I send him like as much positivity as I possibly can. And I'm glad that we're able to celebrate him while he's still here. You know? Amen. Me too. And if I may, I, I feel that this is an appropriate place. I just want to take a moment to acknowledge the life uh, of Gift of Gab, who I just mentioned. Um, yeah. You know, I often feel that, you know, the, the underground hip hop boom of the mid nineties into the early two thousands um, kind of skips over some stuff. I think we, we talk a lot about rockets and deaf jokes and Mad Lib and, you know, to some extent, I feel that there's groups like the living legends and freestyle fellowship and, you know, blue in exile or little brother or sky zoo like there's folks that often don't kids in the hall that don't get the the conversation they should and black delicious is one of those groups and i mean these guys um were making music in the early 90s and gift of gab um you know was not only one half of black delicious with chief excel but that crew was part of a bigger crew when we talk about native tongues the soul sides quantum projects crew and these guys were from Northern California, Northern Central California. Um, Sacramento is what Black Alicious represented, even though Gab had history in LA. And I just, um, for me, I remember being a teenager and hearing um, Swan Lake, which is a phenomenal exercise and just relatability. And you had an MC with an a incredible voice, this ability to rap, about things that no matter who you are, you're going through and then flip the switch. And, you know, Alphabet Aerobics is probably the song that many people know most from the group because he does alliteration going through the whole alphabet. And as the song's going, his delivery picks up its pitch. Um, and Gab, you know, was a, was a bigger guy. And the fact that he was able to rap like that is stunning. You know, people celebrate Papoose and we celebrate a lot of kind of MC clinics. And, you know, when I got news of his passing, it, it really hit me hard. And to your point about biz, we'd known that, um, you know, Gab had been battling with his health for some while. He had a double kidney transplant. He was living with kidney disease. Um, you know, he was really trying his best and recording a lot of music, even through 2020 and the pandemic. But um, that one hit me hard. And again, when it came time to write an obituary, I stopped what I was doing and, and really went all hands on deck with it, not to compete, but to make sure that when this community of hip hop and, and rap music takes a moment to honor one of its fallen, that we get the whole story right. And, and I've even me, I'm you know a 20 plus year fan, 25 year fan. There were things that I've been reading about in the aftermath of that that I didn't know. And um, yeah, it's just uh, 2021 continues to just be a year unlike any other for you know hip hop and, and our heroes. Yeah, man, you put together an amazing send off for him. I read that piece like a fan and just like was uh, one just like incredibly well informed, uh, but also just proud to like you know have uh, a partner like you like holding it down for our publication. I think that you you you, um, you showcase us in such a great light with, with that kind of thing, and I know that you do it with speed and with care, but also like subordinating, you know, your feelings about it for the minute. You know, we've talked about this before. When we get this, we gotta be work mode first, even though a lot of times we're really huge fans of these people. Um, and so, and also know them personally. I know, you know, so uh, I, I commend that, man. Uh, I wasn't up on Black Alicious until about 2003, you know, or 2002, the Blazing Arrow album was my introduction. And I went back and checked out the catalog uh, again, like you said, very much a fan of his lyricism. Um, you know, they were, I almost considered them like the fishbone of rap, you know, very mm. alternative, very, um, you know, college radio, um, college kind of crowd, uh, but really dug the path that they carved out. You know, um, I think that aside from the, um, the big hits that Arrested Development had, they were probably in a similar kind of lane, Invisible Planets and others. There was like that whole wave of artists like that back in the, you know, the mid 90s and, and early 2000s. So 
yeah, big loss, man. Uh, 2021 has been very tough. And, you know, it's, it's this year and, and past years, it's been about violence. This year it's been health, man. And as rap gets older and, you know, we are men in our 50s and late 40s and, you know, whatever, I think that's going to start to reveal itself in such a, such a, um, critical thing that we would take as best care of ourselves as we can. You know? So yeah, rest in peace, gift of gab. You know, so we talked about, um, I told you about some of my favorite MCs. Uh, maybe my favorite MC of all time is Jay-Z. And he was in the news recently for something that could really change the way that um, copyright law is made and the way that uh, photographs are viewed. But you want to you wanna break that down? Yeah, I, this headline shocked me. Um, Jay-Z and his representatives are in a legal battle with Jonathan Mannion. And um, I would say, you know, we lost Chimoto, who I mentioned a moment ago, um, you know, earlier this year, just a few weeks ago. Jonathan Mannion is, is, is like Chi in, in terms of one of the predominant hip hop photographers. We also lost Ricky Powell earlier this year and, and Ricky in another decade, you know, was very active in the 80s and the early 90s. Jonathan has has shot um, not only some of the most iconic album covers, um, he did the DMX Exodus album that, you know, we've spent a lot of time talking about this year, as well as most of, of X's um, iconic album covers, certainly Flesh of My Flesh covered in, you know, the blood, um, and was, was somebody that Def Jam was using a lot and also shot a lot of covers for, the Source, Blaze, Double XL, um, presumably Rap Pages, New York-based photographer, um, and Jay Z and his representatives sued Jonathan for selling images of Jay Z, um, archival images that he's been, you know, selling on his website. And like you said, it it really um, could be a landmark moment surrounding copyright and the relationship artists have with those who take their photo. Yeah, you know, so the way it works is that right now the photographer is the one who owns the copyright for a photo. And there's there's nuances, right? It's got to be, you know, uh, with consent, like, and, and, and things like that. But the photographer is the person who owns that copyright. And often with magazines, um, magazines will pay the photographer for the rights to the photo. They may secure them ex exclusively, but the own the, but the, the the photographer still owns them and often will sell them for commercial purposes. So in this case, um, Jay Z says that he paid that they paid um, pr presumably Rockefeller paid Jonathan Manning handsomely for his photos. Is there was a reasonable doubt photos? Um, I believe so. Yeah. yeah, for those photos, and um, you know he learned that Jonathan Manning had been selling photos on his website, which is common practice. You know, I've, I've actually started collecting hip hop photography over the last couple of years. Um, really enjoy looking at the websites and going to art galleries and figuring out what the pricing is and stuff like that. But this is a, a thing that, that photographers use to make money. Um, and, you know, it's, I would assume it's pretty significant. Um, but, he stepped to Jonathan Mannion and said, hey, listen, like, um, I don't want you selling my stuff on your website. And uh, there was a disagreement. Jonathan Mannion thought that was fully within his right to do. And to date, that has been the case. And he's and so he he uh, continued to sell them. And so then Jay followed up with a lawsuit. Now, if this prevails, it's going to completely change the way that photographs have been handled in the past. And there's, there's been some argument recently, uh, I think it was Khloe Kardashian and um, um, Bella Hadid um, recently have said, listen, uh, and this is more paparazzi stuff. They don't mm -hmm. want, um, uh, actually, um, I think Bella Hadid had put up a photo that had been taken of her and someone else on her Instagram or someplace like that by paparazzi. And the paparazzi sued her uh, for putting a photo of herself up on, you know, her own, like, you know, social media platform. And her argument was that, well, if the photographer is the owner and the theory behind that has been because they, they comprise the, you know, they do the composition, they, they do the like kind of artistic representation. 
she said the composition is more than just the framing and the lighting and stuff like that. It's also the subject, me. And I brought, you know, my outfit to the table, the way that I posed, the way that I smiled, the way I did my hair, whatever it might be. And so we should, in theory, be co-owners of the copyright. And I, and I tried to find, that was back in 2019, I believe, 2016, 2019. I couldn't find any resolution on that. So my guess is that it was, it was uh, settled confidentially. Um, and so there was no precedent set with that one. But this is going to be really, really interesting. I don't know that there's ever been a, uh, an artist of Jay-Z stature who's got you know, unlimited resources when it comes to, to, to legal teams and stuff like that who's made this argument. Um, but it would completely change the game for photographers and make it very difficult for them to have any meaningful compensation given that now like everyone's a photographer and like you got photos are com commoditized in a way that they weren't back then. Back then to have like really professional shot photos was something very, very valuable, but now um, there's less, not to say they're not valuable, but there's less premium put on them than, than before. And so I think it will make it very, very tough. But what do you think about the argument generally? Do you think that a person who's the subject of a photograph should have a right to ownership? I don't. I, um, and, and, and it's, it's certainly tricky, but I, um, I think that there's, there's ways to do it, um, ethically. And, and I, I love Jay-Z. He, he, at various times in, in my life and in his career has been my goat. Um, I think that Jay-Z is big on ownership. And I think especially surrounding reasonable doubt, it's been a funny thing for him. Um, I remember years ago, you know, that's an album that he shares ownership with, or had at one time with Biggs and Dame, no matter the status of those three gentlemen's relationship. And Jay had made a number of attempts to solely own that album, even in, in, in the wake of that kind of turmoil. And I think this is another thing. And you know, it's funny because suddenly a thing like a photograph is going to mean a whole lot more in the face of NFTs. And, you know, 1996, 95, people, you know, we didn't have phones in our pockets. So for somebody like Jonathan Mannion, whether he was commissioned by Rockefeller or not, he, um, you know, he's one of the few who can say he documented that time. And it gets really, 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 really tricky. Because I also know that, you know, oftentimes photographers might give the label or the artist that one shot on the strength that they keep all the others. And those shots may not have value until things change. You know, you and I spoke recently to T. Eric or, or T. Eric Monroe for a great episode of this podcast. And he was talking about some photographs of artists um, who have since passed that have never seen the light of day. And I think how interesting that is for fans. But the question of who owns those photographs are, are very strange, especially in his situation where he was just going to parties or going to events and, you know, snap and flicks. But um it's a very, very, very slippery slope. And I have no doubt that just like sampling in the early 90s, we're going to continue to see this come up because artists want to own their image and likeness. And I think the value of a photograph, you know, is continues to increase. Yesterday, I walked into an Old Navy and they have a whole line dedicated to TLC. Um, I was in a Target recently and, you know, the Rolling Stones are licensing their stuff to target. All of this, all of this material um, just continues to show its value. So as artists are looking to monetize catalog and intellectual property, it's tricky. But, um, you know, I am in favor, potentially, if it's collaborative, but I do not believe that the artist owns the right to every image that's taken of them. And to police that would be insane. Yeah, I almost split mine on this. You know, I, I think that artists absolutely own the rights to their name and likeness. You know, we just saw uh, just in the last few days the NCAA like take huge step in making it so that college athletes can can monetize their own name and likeness and not the universities. I think that's a step in the right direction because if you can't, if you're not the owner of your own name and likeness, then what do you own? You know, so I, I think that that is, I think that's kind of a core thing. And so I think it really should be determined contractually. Um, I'll, I'll be very curious to know, the copyright law is very well settled. It's very clear that in the, the eyes of all the courts, 
um, the, the person who takes the picture owns the copyright. Now, laws change all the time. In theory, they're not supposed to, but there's you know distinctions and stuff that are really pretext for changing the law. Um, you know, um, but um, I'm very curious to see what happens in this situation with, with the contract because if he did pay, if Jay did pay uh, Jonathan Mannion, and they did what's called a, a work for hire agreement then that means that they paid him for his rights. And by getting paid, he agreed to relinquish any right he had in the copyright. That's what, that's how, what artists, what record companies do with artists what, and how they own their masters. You know, they, they, they um, secure the intellectual property that the artist creates as a work for hire, and they then own it outright because they paid for it. So, you know, if Jay did that, then it's, it, there, I don't even know what we're talking about because yeah. clearly, I suspect he didn't, which is why um, Jonathan Mannion, you know, if you read the uh, response very, very carefully, um, you know, his lawyer talked about like him exercising his First Amendment rights, his, his right to copy, his right to copyright is what he said. So I think they, uh, whatever paperwork they did is probably like what magazines do, which they paid him for his services but not necessarily for the right, the copyright itself. Um, but, you know, in the future, should artists, should it be some sort of like, should it be upfront, like determined? I think so, because I think that inherently you should own your name and likeness. Yeah, I mean, contracts are going to change with that. I know for years, you know, I recorded to physical cassette all of my interviews and I had a previous employer that long after our tenure had ended said, I own the, I own those tapes. And I was like, you don't. And those tapes are still with me. And again, the reason, you know, it, it brings it full circle to what we're talking about, because the reason that they reached out to me was, you know, I had conversations with Pimp C, with Proof, with, you know, Guru, with artists that are not here anymore. And there's now a newfound value in that and i've never monetized that i've never posted them online um but that was never in the contract and i know other writers that have altered the contracts with magazines and said i won't write for you unless i retain this this and this and um i think it's really interesting and jonathan mannion is an og jay-z is an og and um i'm curious like your point about the Jenner, you know, Bella Hadid thing, how this one ends, if we will ever get a public, you know, answer on it. Yeah, man. Um, my guess is that they settle um, because, you know, court is really expensive and it's got huge implications. Um, I'm not sure if Jonathan Manning wants to do that, but uh, I'd be very curious. He's also, he's also a very prominent photographer. So if he doesn't, defend himself then more people could come after him i know the game the documentary you know and there's there's lots of like artists out there who might follow suit so it might be in his best interest to 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 push it so i don't know this is going to be an interesting one to keep our eye on for sure and, and one thing i want to add too is there's a trend that i don't think people mention enough is artists of a certain ilk are now inviting photographers they're granting access that's unheard of at a time when access is everything. And I feel like there are contracts behind the scenes of if I'm Jay-Z and Beyonce, if I'm Tyler, the creator, if I'm Little Wayne, if I'm even Griselda has like an in-house photographer that controls their, their public image. And on one hand, they might say, Hey, go make money. You know, if double XL magazine needs a photo of Tyler, they're going to come to you and I want you to get paid for it. But I get to sign off on everything because I don't want this photo to be out if it's not aligned with how I want my image to be, you know, disseminated. So, you know, I'm curious. Yeah, Beyonce is incredibly protective like that. You know, I don't know if there's any photos that get out, you know, besides the paparazzi thing. The, the way the paparazzi thing works is that photographers are allowed to take pictures of subjects for editorial purposes. So if it's, uh, you know, for, a news story or something like that, they can take the picture without the person's consent. But in any other context, be it a portrait or something like that, or, you know, you, ha you have to get consent in order to do it. So, yeah, man, but Jay's in the news for other things too. Um, a few months ago, he sold part of um, 
uh, he sold title and ace of spades for a, a, a total of as much as six hundred million dollars. No one knows the exact figures, but like the news, the, the news that was going around at the time suggested there was at least a half a billion, maybe six hundred million dollars. And one of the things that we talked about, I was speculating that Jay might have been liquidating those funds in order to make a move of some sort. You know, there was some nonsense about him and uh, Beyonce getting divorced and stuff like that. I didn't buy into that. But I thought that he might be preparing to invest in something, you know, maybe a team or something like that. But uh, just this week, news broke that Rock Nation participated in a transaction with Blackstone, which is an investment firm that buys companies and uh, makes like significant investments um, in buying a company called Certified Collectibles Group. And this is a company that you know, verifies uh, the authenticity of collectibles. So think of baseball cards, stamps, artwork, um, even securities at this point, but anything that is a collectible that, you know, would, would, would have retain or increase its value through, through some sort of like confirmation, uh, they are the, the group that does that. And so um, the deal was valued, valued uh, the company at $500 million. Unclear how much of that Rock Nation put in. Um, there are a couple other people. Um, Daryl um, Mori, I, I believe his name is, the guy who's president of operations for the Sixers. Um, I think um, maybe Michael Rubin uh, from the Sixers as well, owner as well. Uh, so quite a few people. Um, but, you know, this is an interesting, interesting play for me. And I'm wondering if it's, it's the beginning of kind of like an acquisition spree or investment spree for Jay. And a lot of ways he's kind of, he's rebalancing his portfolio, right? So he had liquor and probably made as much money as he could from that, although that's kind of an inexhaustible revenue stream. Um, and then he had um, Tidal and we all know kind of like how Tidal has fared compared to like Spotify and Apple and, and others. If you think about growth sectors, these collectibles, going back to the NFT conversation, so it's, all, it's mostly been about physical goods to date, but I think that the digital collectibles world is about to explode. And if you think about NBA Top Shots, where you can own like a play or a dunk or whatever it might be, and like, you know, the artwork like Beeple's, which sold for $60 million and all these things, uh, th there needs to be some sort of like um, verification of the authenticity of these things. And the, now the NFT itself is that, you know, because NFT is not counterfeitable, you know, it can't be transferred without the, the ownership. So I'm not sure exactly how the two were intertwined, but my guess is that somehow um, they are going into the collectibles digital market. And, and so like Top Shots is not true NFTs because it's not, tethered to the blockchain, uh, they're just digital assets. And so if they're gonna start to verify things like that, Jay could have just like invested in another company that's gonna be a multi-billion dollar company and like, you know, uh, I triple my, put me anywhere on God's green, God green earth, I triple my worth. Like, Word. Yeah. <laughs> so he might be about to triple up again, you know? I, I wholeheartedly agree. And, you know, I'll, I'll use a song of Jay I don't like as much, but Picasso, baby. I mean, Jay, you know, owns Basquiat's, he has been an avid art collector, talked about it more and more in his lyrics over the last, you know, 10 years. And I believe that the same way that, you know, in art or, you know, in classic cars or in autographs, sports memorabilia, you're going to need verification. And I think we are living in a time where people are hung up on the experiences and that that can be in the physical world and that can be in the virtual world. So I think we're going to see more of it. I'm blown away. You know, we see this amongst our our heroes and the people we cover you know quest love on quest love supreme has talked about trading reels you know like it's not about records anymore it's about the actual multi-track sessions and artists are trading those with each other the same way that athletes um you know are trading game worn jerseys you know and you see that after the super bowl or after you know playoff nba games you know guys trading up um you know eminem has supposedly one of the greatest collections of, of hip-hop t-shirts you know a vintage thing so i think we're only going to see more of it and i think jay is on the front lines because he knows the value of collection and he knows that whether you or i you know might never have a basquiat we want to collect we want to show we want to represent ourselves and express ourselves 
through what we're part of. And now we're living in a time where that's no longer the CD collection or the record collection. So what is it? It's NFTs and it's these other things. And of course, there's a huge business in legitimizing, you know, our portfolios. Yeah. And like I said, for me, it's the hip hop photos. I mean, just to bring it back, like I think I still like the tangible things. You know, uh, it's cool to have like something digital, but like, you know, I'm not going to walk around showing stuff uh, on my phone. So, you know, I think that the artwork is something I can look at and, you know, really helps me express myself when people come in the house and stuff like that. But yeah, it's no denying that digital is going to be huge. Um, you see it on stuff like um, Fortnite and, you know, other things where you know, these, you know, uh, so-called metaverses are, are happening and, you know, people want as much digital clout as they have physical clout. And so, yeah, I can, I can see this company being gigantic. So uh, very interesting, man. Like uh, Hope is always a few steps ahead. Big facts, man. So, uh, you know, other things in the news, real, real quick bite, but uh, your man logic. I feel like you owe me a drink or, you know, maybe uh, Ace of Spades or something, <laughs> man. He, uh, his, unre- you know, his retirement, <laughs> you know, lasted about as long as I thought it would. And he trolled the public with some new songs um, announcing that he's back and that his retirement was not to be. And as we talk about just the integrity that I think the media needs to have, I'm going to come in bold and real and say, you know, I am so flipping sick of artists announcing retirements. I think we were doing it in the nineties when too short and Scarface were announcing their retirements, Master P and coming back. It was corny when the game and Lupe fiasco did it, both of whom continue to make music. And I don't know why um, anyone is surprised that logic is back. Yeah. I don't, I don't know why artists feel the need to even say this. Like, if anything, say you're gonna take a break, but why not just take a break? You know, like, um, I don't get it. Like in a lot of ways, it seems like just a way to kind of like stir up hype for the sales or something like that. It's kind of like how many farewell tours has Kiss had or yeah. the Who or, you know, yeah. so, yeah, I don't know. So he got a new project out, um, the YS uh, Collection Volume 1. Is that new or is that like, like is that like Lost Tapes type stuff? That I can't speak on. I know that he did put out some music that I believe to be new, at least to the public. Um, and, you know, and, and I know I make this caveat every time I take a shot at, at Logic, but like, you know, early, early uh, adopter, early person to cover and write about him. Um, I've, all, I've never questioned his skills, but I've always, you know, questioned and not always, but recently integrity. And, and this is a case of that. But yeah, I think um, he's, he's just ramping up and yeah, uh, young Sinatra is back like he never left yeah i'm still a fan uh i haven't put anything from this uh, new project on the playlist which i'm sure you're very glad <laughs> it's been, it's been stay for a year but my luck you and i the next time we hang out we'll run into him and you'll be like yo this guy over here <laughs> <laughs> he knows he knows probably so. <laughs> so yeah um anything else man um anything else you want to cover no i mean oh, you what mentioned... about snoop snoop and Def Jam? yeah snoop is now a creative uh an executive of creative and strategic consultant at Def Jam. Um, I think that's interesting. I mean, uh, Snoop, you know, is not a artist that people associate with Def Jam. As far as I know, never worked with the label at an artistic level. But I mean, Snoop has been tied into, you know, obviously Death Row, No Limit, Star Trek. I mean, he's worked with some labels. And I am a fan of when an OG can come in and bring attention to others. I always think that's the appeal of, you know, what used to happen when, you know, an artist would sign another artist and kind of give them the co-sign. And you and I have spoken recently over, you know, Def Jam has, I think, a great roster right now, including, you know, DMX, you know, and put out an album this year, but they don't have necessarily that, that name brand leadership anymore. You know, Jay-Z is not running the show. Um, no one is running the show right now. They don't have a, a real, they don't have a dedicated president. You know? So to see Snoop come in and have his, you know, have an opportunity to just kind of shine a little light on something. I, I think it's cool, but I don't know if it's going to change things dramatically. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting. Like um, I don't really understand what it's intended to do aside from bring that artistic credibility to it, you know, while they're kind of looking for the next leader. Um, but Snoop is, and, and, and Snoop is an interesting one too, given how much 
his legacy is associated with death row even post no limit mm -hmm. and all the other labels he's been signed to um but there's no question that he is truly the hip-hop uncle you know i don't know that anyone has beef with, with with snoop like i think that most people gravitate toward him he's been an ambassador you know you see it on ggn and you know the and, and i've been to parties where he just is holding court but he's just a, a great dude so if there's an opportunity to associate with him for a while why not like but you know it, it was an interesting move for me yeah and I, I think that's just it and and let's not forget you know 20 years ago def jam brought in scarface to run def jam south and that's how we got ludicrous um so i hope that you know you and i are big on mentorship and having different generations be there for each other so if there's a way to do that and also get a check for an og i'm all for it um another just quick thing in passing um you know you shared something on our socials you know reasonable doubt turned 25 this summer uh in the month of june 25 years also for uh de la soul stakes is high which you know, I think is an undeniable classic album. And of course, released the same day as Nas's sophomore, it was written. Um, you know, we talked about Sony earlier, they re, they created a deluxe edition <clears throat> of the album and included uh, a song not initially released with it, Silent Murder, which, you know, has been widely circulated on mixtapes and the internet. I think it, it's, a, it's a gem of the music that Nas made you know, for those sessions. And they also released a previously unheard, at least to me, version of Street Dreams with another verse on it. I didn't find any controversy with the new verse or, you know, it was just one of those things that, you know, the track masters or, or some A&R was like, nah, go with this, go with this one. But, um, you know, I know that album is very polarizing and I know those two albums releasing on the same day our uh, good friend and colleague, Justin Hunt, made a phenomenal breakdown video four years ago, four years ago exactly, um, breaking down those joints and, and why that was such a, a watershed moment for hip hop consumption. But um, yeah, just yeah, one of those. And that was building off Ninth Wonder's IG post. Right. Uh, Ninth Wonder um, said that that day that those two albums was, were, were released was the day that hip hop split. You know, before it, people just listen to rap music and they could listen to everything from Young MC and uh, Tone Loke to Big Daddy Kane and EPMD and it was just all rap music but at that point is when it split and you had commercial rap which you know Nas you know people going in that direction were kind of like in the Nas camp and then you had underground rap uh which was De La and then you know evolved into Rockus and like you know a lot of a lot of stuff thereafter and it's a really, really interesting, cool theory. Um, he supports it really well. Um, and yeah, Justin, Justin did that video based off that, but that was that was dope for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so anything else you want to add before we just talk about new music? Yeah, one last thing. This this took off on the site last week. So Jim Jones and Conway the Machine uh had a uh, I won't call it a beef because it's all love, but they had a back and forth, shall we say, um, over social media saying uh, you know talking about battling and um it was uh jim jones was i think trying to get a versus uh, he was trying to get someone com competing versus with him and ended up that you know he and conway started having an exchange and more from that to um you know let's get on a track together and battle to nah let's just just straight up battle let's let's just battle like you know mano a mano head to head um, you put on a beat and I'll rap and vice versa. And uh, so it stirred up a lot. It, it definitely got a huge response out of our audience. Uh, it sounded like they were seriously entertaining. And I'm sure now after seeing the activity uh, and the potential bag that might be associated with, they got to be giving it serious thought. But who do you think would win in a battle between Jim and Conway? I'm a Jim Jones fan. I've been a Jim Jones fan even before we fly high. I think Conway would eat Jim's lunch. And I think Jim is making some of the best music in his career right now. And, and there have been times where I've wanted to get, especially when we were publishing on a daily basis, um, Jim's music more on the site. But I think I think Conway would, would, would body him. Um, I also... I have some additional thoughts on this. I do believe, um, so if you pay attention to this conversation, it all kind of exists around the complex ecosystem. 
Um, it was B Dot, who I know a lot of folks associate with Rap Radar and uh, other places. But on behalf of Complex, he was interviewing Jim, and you know, it seems if you really kind of watch the tapes, I have a feeling that this battle will happen. But I think it's going to happen in a very um, interesting way that's going to be very user friendly. And I, I believe that Versus has had so much success since March of 2020 that we're going to start to see some competitors. And it's not just going to be straight Versus of go through the catalog. And I think what Versus accomplished is there's an ability for two artists to duke it out, you know, and not have serious repercussions. We are no longer living in the era of LL Cool J and Cool Modi. We are no longer living in the era of Jay-Z versus Nas. You can have two artists square up in the ring put it down, slap hands, be cool, walk away, and it amplifies both of their profiles and both of their catalogs. So I think that there's going to be an alternative, and I think Complex is very um, smart in the space, and I have a feeling I know where this battle is going to appear, and it's just a matter of when the date is. The second thing is I see this being a bigger trend in hip-hop for the reasons I just said, but since that story kind of broke out over the last 10 days, um, Royce the 5'9", you know, an artist that we hold in the highest, you and I both, and AFH, has been kind of welcoming challengers too. I mean, he has his own podcast now with Lupe, but he's, um, you know, Mickey Fax and RJ Payne and a crop of really dope MCs have been kind of circling each other on who would win. So I think we're, I think we're going to start to see a new outlet, you know, not unlike what we're talking about with NFTs for great MCs and great probably producers too to duke it out and it's outside of versus and I think that versus you know Swizz and Tim um, you know selling versus and sharing it you know with all of the contenders I think it gave way to like okay what's the next thing going to be I mean that's just always been innovation and that's kind of also the hip-hop way and you know I liken it to that in battle rap, you know, and the URL and, and, you know, what uh, Smack and E. Beasley and, you know, all these people had done through the 2000s. I think we're headed somewhere really interesting than this. And I know to, to some people, Jim and Conway might not make sense on paper, but both of these guys bring a really cool Venn diagram of hip hop listeners with a quite a bit of overlap to the table. And I think it'll be a, um, a moment that is talked about with some domino rally effect. That's an interesting theory, man. I, I think you might be onto something. Um, I hope it's good. You know, uh, most of these copycats just just are not good. They're just money grabs and and, and you can see it. But, you know, I, I, I'll be right there for real battles, like, you know, like, of, like top tier MCs. I think that would be dope. Like, um, you know, the battle rap thing has been around for a long time. Smack URL has been like kind of the king of that. I did a deal with them when I was at a BET to like rebrand Freestyle Friday into Ultimate Freestyle Friday and have a real love for that. Actually, I uh, met Kevin Durant one time I was on stage for one of the events and um, we're, we're, the, the battle was about to happen. I was like, yo, Kev, what's going on, man? And you know, talking to chatting. And then the, the battle started and I was standing right in front of him. I looked back and I was like, yo, can you see? <laughs> he laughed, he laughed. Uh, and then like the, the action shifted and the, the crowd kind of shifted a little bit and he was right in front of me and he, and he never looked back and asked me anything. So, uh, but yeah, man, um, the battle rap thing with superstars like that, you know, I know Joe Budden and um, who was it? Hollow the Don um, yeah, did their no. thing back in the day. Keith Murray, Cannabis, like yeah. Cassidy. We've watched a lot of guys step into that league for new awareness. And, and also, let's not forget, I mean, Versus has this ability to switch between genre, different fan bases and personas within hip hop. But the most recent battle, if less I'm mistaken, was Bow Wow versus uh, Soldier Boy. So for quote unquote real hip hop to use these moments to be like, nah, we're going to do this our way, um, it just makes sense. Yeah. And speaking of complex, so they were acquired since we last had one of these two by BuzzFeed for $300 million from Hearst Verizon. They'd already been acquired once. Um, I think it was like maybe $50 million more than what um, Verizon Hearst paid for it. Uh, so not a huge uptick, and especially given the amount 
of money they probably put into it. Uh, I'm not sure they made any money off at all from it. But it's interesting. This is part of a SPAC, a special purpose acquisition company. And we had talked about that uh, a couple of weeks ago. And that's how the company that Faith Newman is the creative um, executive for um, bought the Tommy Boy catalog. Um, so I'm not sure. Supposedly, the editorials are going to remain separate. Um, there'll probably be some consolidation of like the back end functions and stuff like that. Um, but it'll be interesting to see how Complex and BuzzFeed work together as an entity. Yeah, agreed. That'll be uh, that'll be very interesting. Yeah. So in terms of new music, um, the Roots re-release "Do You Want More?" Um, that's one of my favorite, if not my favorite, Roots album. It's probably um, between that and. Um, uh why am i flipping uh, act two hip hop and that what's the things uh, fall apart yeah things fall apart those two um probably uh do you want more um uh, ton of remixes on it but the the standout cut is um a, a track and it's every mc uh black thought raps like cool g rap and ice cube and uh like pete rock what, Pete Rock, Chuck D, um, really in it spot on. I mean, spot on, like scary good sometimes. And that one went wild for us. Um, you want to talk about Tyler, the Creator? Yeah, and that joint's on our playlist. Uh, Tyler, the Creator, put out a joint called Call Me If You Get Lost. Um, I thought he had a phenomenal BET Awards performance, um, you know, and uh, of Lumberjack. This album's interesting, you know, Tyler, the last two projects, I feel like in a lot of ways has gotten further away from rap and hip hop. Um, this one really brought him back in a big way. And I think Tyler is so stylized. Um, I've never seen an artist, you know, Drake made a playlist with more life. Tyler made a Gangsta Grills mixtape with Call Me If You Get Lost down to having DJ drama talk all over it. I think like for any rap fans of the mid to late 2000s um this is just pure nostalgia but also it's not like tyler's going completely retro i do believe that he um is deeply influenced by griselda on this one um you know tyler has been a a guest on west side guns recent projects um but he seems to have found a battery in his back for kind of rapping like gun in my opinion and i want to give a shout out to my former colleague and dear friend andres tardio who's at genius we were talking about it and he really made that point um you can just kind of hear it and at times you know much like gun uh tyler can be incredibly insightful but he can also be very whimsical and not get too bogged down with making every line you know a dart um, but I thought that this project, you know, his subject matter is still, um, you know, very uh, on his own. This album deals a lot with race and, and black identity, as well as, again, Tyler talking a lot about interpersonal relationships and some, you know, admissions, you know, surrounding his sexuality, which, you know, he's addressed on recent albums in the past. I think it's a very, very good project. I saw some folks, you know, immediately kind of plant the flag that this is the new best of 2021 um with respect to j cole and evidence i don't think so but i continue to listen to this album a lot i played it yesterday on a road trip um and he's got a host of guests on there as well from little wayne to uh jay versace which again you know to my uh to my griselda point jay versace produced boldy james's versace tape which released on griselda um, and, and Tyler's doing some really interesting things, giving executive producer credits to songs, not just the album. And he gave Jay uh, a joint on Safari. But, you know, that's that's kind of a roundabout. What was uh, any takeaways from you on the project? That's really interesting. I, I got to listen to it more. Um, I liked it. I, I think I, I said before, I didn't like it as much as the album two albums ago, Flower, with Flower, Flower Boy. Um, yeah. At that album uh, I loved, and interestingly, that one it wasn't like the last one, and which I think you even didn't want to classify as like a hip hop record. The last one you, you saw it as more almost like um, like R and B or yeah, like, and, he, yeah. and even Tyler said that after getting the Grammy Award, yeah. he really kind of pointed to the to the the race element when he received that of like, come on, this is really yeah. like I don't yeah, but anyway, continue yeah, so. Um, but I got to listen to it more. I, I like the DJ, DJ drama part. I had not 
made the connection with West Side Gun, so I'm going to listen to it with, with that uh, lens. But he, I, I love Tyler, man. Always really push, pushing the envelope. His BET Awards performance was amazing. One of the highlights that and Queen Latifah tribute for me. Um, you know, he is, he's great. I think he's, uh, he's been around now for more than 10 years and still mm -hmm. incredibly relevant and just con continue, uh, continue on the ascent. So this is an album I will listen to several times. I always give him that respect as an artist. He's kind of artist who opens up and you appreciate more later. So definitely want to check that out. Um, only other thing that released of note for me was evidence. And you know, we got a whole interview dedicated to evidence from last week. And we talked extensively about this album. You and I have been living with it for several weeks now um, in our top 10 of 21 video. But man, that album is still phenomenal. Uh, super heavy rotation for me. I know it is for you. Um, definitely contender for album of the year for me. Um, I can't say enough about evidence that the music is phenomenal. His, you know, half bars are just like so insightful. The dude is incredible. And so um, I, I urge anyone who has not picked up that album, if you are a fan of hip hop, especially the kind of hip hop that we cover, you will not be disappointed. Yeah, I, I echo all of that. And, and really, you know, you said it right there. I encourage anyone to listen to that episode. We, uh, we had the opportunity to have the album in advance and really ask Ev what I thought were some really, uh, you know, great, thoughtful album specific questions. Just two joints I want to I want to highlight on on the way out. Um, you know, Mass Ace, we talked about Biz and Juice Crew earlier. Ace is another artist. We've said it here before. I've said it. You've said it continues to get better with time. Um, you know, his Brooklyn story a few years ago with Marco Polo is just a great, a great example, like evidence. Um, like Black Thought solo work of watching, you know, a 30 year artist continue to evolve. He put out a joint called Home in America, which, you know, when I spoke of the fourth and not everyone celebrating, um, it's a great record that captures the nuance of, you know, identity in the current state. And, you know, I say this as a white guy, but I mean, he speaks a lot of Black history and just how he looks at his country and patriotism right now. It's a collaboration with the Analog Players Society, but Ace is very much, um, you know, spearheading the song. It's a it's a jazz uh, collaboration with rapping, and it's from Rope -a Dope Records, which is a great label with some roots here in Philly, and has worked with Questlove and DJ Logic and a host of other people over the years. I also want to give a shout out to, to DJ K Slay and K Slay. You know, churns out music he has for the last 15 years um, and he always does these projects and I think in the past there have been times where you've been more enthused by them than I am where he gets like five or 10 or 15 or 20 MCs and makes these super sprawling posse cuts but on his new album he has a joint called Rolling 110 Deep and it's more than just an attention grab uh, and I say this after a podcast where we've spoken about you know, some trolls and attention grabs, but he's got, I mean, it's funny because I can't even tell you, but like dozens upon dozens of respected MCs doing eight bar verses. There's a video that reminds me a lot of Sway and King Tex, the anthem, where they go from artist to artist. And, you know, just as we talk about hip hop, it's a great display of unity and it's like 16 minutes long, but I encourage anyone that just loves collaboration and wants to hear from some MCs that they haven't heard in a while. It's got The Locks, M.O.P., Bumpy Knuckles, Ghostface, Raekwon, Crooked Eye, Ice-T. I can go on and on. Um, but it's just a really cool song. And at a time when we talk about controversies and disappointments and all of that, um, I like this one a lot. And shout out to Kay Slay. The artwork on his new album is one of those like Martha Cooper era, you know, photographs that remind you that that K Slay was a graffiti writer first and um, just 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 a real cool piece of culture. Yeah, he was in Star Wars, right? Uh, yeah, man. Yeah. So he did something. He's been, like you said, been doing this and he's been up in the ante uh, every release in terms of MCs and length. I think last year it was like up to 10 minutes, 12 minutes. And now you're saying 16. So 
Um, I'm curious, man. Like, um, I wonder how far it's going to go, um, you know, in terms of length. But yeah, I'll check, I'll check this out. Definitely- yeah, it reminded me of those old Tony Touch tapes where he would yeah. just have like the 50 MCs, man. So yeah. yeah, man, what's your song of the week? So my song of the week is by Horseman, who put out an album a few weeks ago. Um, and the, it, the song is called This Shit Right Here. Um, the, the, the album is called The Last Ride. Um, the, the, the song is called This Shit Right Here. And I think it's dope. I think it's a phenomenal beat for the four of them. Uh, I think Cannabis Corrupt, Killer Priest, and Raskat sound amazing. Um, you know, I think Raz sounds as good as he sounded, you know, in, in, on any of his albums in a while, just always bringing like thought provoking stuff to the table. And so, yeah, that, that was it for me. How about you? Yeah, man, it's great to see those guys come together 20 years after that an album was kind of teased. Uh, for me, rest in peace, uh, Gift of Gab, Swan Lake, which, uh, you know, phenomenal song from their Melodica EP. And if no one's heard that, it is on the DSPs. I encourage anyone to listen to that song he's not it's not alphabet aerobics but it shows the heart soul and substance of a great mc who's no longer with us we're dope all right man always a pleasure likewise man until we do it again we're